Come on, who's excited to be in God's house? Make some noise, church. We are in the final installment, part seven of a series, Come Holy Spirit. And we have been seeing a lot of um, work that the Holy Spirit is doing in people's lives over these last seven weeks. And we started this series to kind of um, uh, get us closer to the person of the Holy Spirit. And we even titled the title as a prayer to um, pray to invite him little by little, deeper, deeper, more intimately into our life. Come Holy Spirit. Let's say this one more time together, this title. Come on. One, two, three. Come, Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's our prayer today. And I believe God does. God, the Holy Spirit, wants to come into your life. Show up today in a very powerful way. I'm going to tell you where we're going in a moment, but let me begin with Acts chapter 19, verse 1 and 2. And this kind of depicts why I'm even doing this series and why we're studying this series in Acts chapter 19. Uh, This is actually, chapter 19 of Acts takes place in A.D. 54. So this is 24 years after Jesus rose from the grave. Jesus rose in AD 30. So this is 24 years. Uh, For 24 years, they've been advancing the gospel. Uh, The apostles, the disciples, they've been missionaries. They've been preaching to Gentiles, and it's been expanding. 24 years now is where we're at in the timeline of Acts chapter 19. It says this, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior to arrive at a city called Ephesus. There he found some of the disciples, and he asked them, hey, did you guys, I mean, you guys believe in Jesus and all, but did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And here's why we're doing this series, because I think the answer is very similar today. They go, no, we haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit And and I think that's the answer a lot of people have. If not, no, we haven't heard there's a Holy Spirit. The answer is like, I think I have the Holy Spirit. I think I'm filled with the Spirit. I think it's, and so there's a lot of confusion around the person of the Holy Spirit. And and a lot of it, to be honest, has nothing to do with the Bible. I don't think people are confused about the Holy Spirit because of what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. People are confused about the Holy Spirit and the things surrounding the Spirit because of the packaging the Holy Spirit has been put in, the people the preconceived ideas that we have and perspectives. It's kind of um, uh, got a lot of people scared from approaching things of the Spirit and all things around the Holy Spirit. So that's why we're doing this series, because I'm trying to demystify and despookify and, and just help you understand that he's not weird, right? You can have a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit. And so I wanna ask you to do something with me today. And it might seem a little bit scary, but I would love for us to just put aside maybe these preconceived ideas that we had about the Holy Spirit and uh, put, put aside your, uh, the packaging that kind of turns you off with the Holy Spirit. Maybe even the people that you have encountered that maybe have put you off uh, to the things of the Holy Spirit. Today, if we can just kind of put those to the side and approach the Word of God with a clean slate today, I believe the Word of God is truth and has truth for us. And if we can get rid of our, uh, the filters that are not helpful to us receiving truth, I believe God wants to reveal Himself to you today. Can I get an amen, church? Okay, today is Pentecost Sunday, though. And even as we say the, the, the Pentecost Sunday, it really is associated to another word. And it makes you think Pentecostal. And for some of you, that might bring up some packaging people or perspectives that, that might turn off. Others of you have great experience. I was not raised in church, so I don't have much of experience at all that a lot of you might have that puts you off to the things of the Spirit. But Acts chapter 2, verse 1 actually says, when the day of Pentecost came... And Acts chapter 2 was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out and the church was birthed on this day. So the question I kind of want to answer, ask and answer with you guys today is, what is Pentecost? Here's where I would like to start. What is Pentecost? And I want to study this with you from probably a perspective. Again, here's what I've done throughout the series, right? I've gotten us to look at the Word of God, hopefully through the lens of the context of the disciples and the apostles from a lens of like Hebrew culture, because here we are 2,000 years away, we're Americans. We, when we hear Pentecost, it comes up with different, I don't know, thoughts and pictures. And, but, but to them, Pentecost was very different, very um, normal, actually. Pentecost was simply a Jewish holiday that they would celebrate. Every year, they would celebrate it. 
So, so what I'd like to do is show you what the fulfillment of Pentecost means, because there's a powerful meaning in the, the Acts chapter 2 Pentecost, when, it, when the Holy Spirit fulfillment of Pentecost came, that there's actually what in, in theology it's called um, fulfillment mirrors, that a lot of times the, the New Testament mirrors events and actions that happen in the Old Testament, like when it was a prophecy was fulfilled, it mirrors an event. And there's two very beautiful mirrors that you need to see. I think it's going to awaken and just kind of bring some awareness to this day of Pentecost that maybe we don't have because it's not our culture. But those people of those culture would make these connections and these fulfillment mirror connections really simply because they knew it. The Pentecost to them was an annual Jewish holiday that was celebrated every year. And it was a, the celebration was for the giving of the law through, through the prophet Moses by God on Mount Sinai. That's what every year, that's what they would celebrate. It was the giving of the law on Mount Sinai from God through Moses to us. And the word Pentecost literally means when you translate the word Pentecost, get ready for this, I'm gonna freak you out. It's scary, it's really scary, guys. Brace yourself. The definition of Pentecost is 50. Woo. No, it's like, right, that's not scary, right? That's not freaky. There ain't nothing scary about 50. Of, it's not as spooky as you think. Penta is, is where the pentagram comes from, right? Five points, it means five. And cost or costi is to the 10th power. Pentecost means five to the 10th power or, or 50. And the reason why they called this day that they celebrated the giving of the law, 50 or Pentecost, was because it was literally 50 days counted down from Passover, that's what it was. So if you take Easter, which we celebrated just seven weeks ago, right? Easter, and you count seven weeks, and we're in part seven of this series because we started right after Easter, you guys. But you count seven weeks from Easter, you get to the day of Pentecost. It's 50 days from Easter. It's the giving of the law from God through the prophet Moses. And, and at that experience, there was thunder and earthquake and fire and loud noises. God showed up and gave the law to his people. But there's a very beautiful, very powerful fulfillment mirror of the day of Pentecost from Acts chapter 2 that actually it mirrors what happened at Exodus in that giving of the law. Let me, let me show you kind of what happened here. What are the characteristics of, of the, the day of Pentecost that was celebrated in the Old Testament, the giving of the law? Uh, a few things. A cloud descended with a loud no noise and fire. That's what happened on Mount Sinai. A cloud descended on the mountain. There was, there was loud noise, a thundering, and fire on the mountain. That's what happened. The second thing that happened was God wrote the law on tablets of stone, right? Gave Moses the law, the Ten Commandments, on tablets of stone. And Moses takes those Ten Commandments down to the people. Do you remember what the people were doing down there? They couldn't wait they actually built an idol, a golden calf, and they were worshiping this golden calf. And because of that, 3,000 people died on that original day of Pentecost that the Hebrew people culturally celebrated every year. They celebrated the giving of the law that was written on tablets, and 3,000 people disobeyed and died because of their idol their, their idol worship. Now, look at the fulfillment mirror, though, of Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, day of Pentecost, descended with a loud sound and fire. We see that. We studied that here in Acts chapter 2. He, we'll read it again today. He descended with a loud sound and fire. And God didn't write his law on tablets of stone anymore. God wrote his law on our hearts, so we get God on the inside of us. And guess how many people, they didn't die like they did in the original Pentecost, but on the day of Pentecost, how many people got saved? 3,000 people got saved. What a beautiful mirror that this is, this holiday is. Now let me show you some scriptures. Acts chapter 1, it says, After Jesus' suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And before you go, well, I thought you said 50 Hold on, I'll show you where the 50 all comes in. At 40 days, he says he spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. And that's where the 10 days comes in, because they waited 10 days after the ascension of Jesus. They waited for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized 
with the Holy Spirit. Why? We've been studying this. Why, Jesus, do we need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? He said, because you need to have power. And this power doesn't save you, but you need this power to accomplish the purpose that God has for your life, to be a successful witness for him on earth. This is what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Why? Because he's got work for you to do that you can't do in your own strength. Amen, somebody? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea, Samaria, and into the ends of the earth. So what does Pentecost really mean? It's not about, you know, crazy church services. It's not a denomination. It's not a religion. It's not about goosebumps. It's not about falling over. It's not about this crazy stuff. It's not. And I believe that the enemy has been largely successful in causing a lot of division and distraction and making people kind of afraid and hesitant to step into the promise of God to, out, to pour out his spirit on all flesh. He's been successful to keep us away from these things because he knows that you need the power of God to fulfill his purpose in your life. Look, if, it, if, it's, if it's God, then it's good. So what does Pentecost really mean? It's the power to make a difference, church. That's what Pentecost is. It's not weird. It's not spooky. It's the power because God has a job for you to do. And you cannot fulfill the job he has for you in the strength that you have within yourself. You need the power of God to fulfill it. So Pentecost, Acts 2 Pentecost, is the reversal of the law given through Moses to the spirit given through Jesus. It is the reversal, the blessed reversal of the law that brings death and the spirit that gives life. But that's not the only fulfillment mirror that happens in Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. There's actually another really cool fulfillment of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is mirrored in the Old Testament. That again, um, a lot of these Hebrews and apostles and Israelites, they would understand these and maybe see these a lot, of, a lot more readily available to make the connection. But us, because we're 2,000 years apart and we don't have the culture, we're, it's, it's not as easily connecting the dots. So I'm going to help you connect some dots, very powerful dots here about the day of Pentecost. Ze Zephaniah chapter 3 Verse 9, it's in the, a book in the Old Testament, prophetic book in the Old Testament. And here's what this prophet prophesied. He said this, for at that time, in that time that he's talking about is the time the Messiah comes. He's talking, this is a, pro a prophecy about the Messiah. So when the Messiah comes, at that time, I will change, or the word there is restore or reverse, I will restore the speech of the peoples to a pure speech. I want you to notice that, okay? That he says, when the Messiah comes, I'm going to restore the language of the people back to a pure language. That all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. Notice that again, one accord. They would be of one spirit. So this is a messianic prophecy, okay? That, the, that many of the Jews would understand that part of that prophecy of the Messiah coming would be there would be a, a restoration of our language to a pure speech. Every language on earth, you guys, is impure. We have impure speech. There's foul language, there's filth, there's violence, there's abuse in every known tongue to man. There is, there is filthy language. But God said when the Messiah comes, he's going to bring back a pure speech where there's a language of heaven, where there is no filth. There is no evil in the language of heaven. None at all, Okay. So, but I want you to notice he, he's, he's saying to restore that speech. He didn't say, I'll bring, I'll bring a new language. He said, restore. So, so meaning that there was at one time this language on earth. And the Bible actually talks about this language that we were speaking on earth. Do you know that there was a time that, that humanity actually had one language, a shared language on earth? The Bible records that in Genesis chapter 11, the time where it actually was confused and the language was, was dispersed, okay? It, it happened at the Tower of Babel. Now, I want to make this connection for you because this is actually a messianic prophecy about the language of God being restored to, to people and that we would be of one spirit because of our one language, all right? Well, what happened? When do we lose this one language? Genesis chapter 11 tells us about the Tower of Babel. Let's take a look at it. Genesis 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. 
So this is early in the book of Genesis. So Adam and Eve, the language that they were speaking and the language their ancestors spoke, it was this one language that we had up until this moment. There was one language, the same words. Verse 2, and as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Let me time out right here and just point out to you that that their wicked intent here was to actually reach heaven by their own means, by their own hands, by their own ingenuity and their own strength, and make a name for themselves. So they wanted to reach heaven on their own terms, without the terms of God, aside or apart from the the terms of God, we are going to make a name for ourselves and reach the heavens. Verse 5 says, and the Lord came down to see the city. Notice with me that God came down to the Tower of Babel, okay? He came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, look at this, they are one people and they have one language And this is only the beginning of what they're going to do. Nothing they propose to do will now be impossible with them. Here's what God is saying. Because they have one language and they're of one accord, nothing that that the the people that God created in his his image, nothing they they do will be impossible because they have the one language and they're in one spirit. Even if they try to do something evil and they have an intention to do something wrong, nothing will be impossible for them when they have one language and they're of one accord. So he says, come, let us go down there. Now notice the, the language here, let us. This is the Trinity involved, so the Holy Spirit is involved here in coming down from heaven on the Tower of Babel. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was named it was called Babel. This place is actually the, the center of where Babylon would be located. Babylon means city of confusion. That's what that means. Babel means confuse or confusion. This was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them all over the face of the earth. Okay, so there's this prophecy. Follow me. There's a prophecy that, that the Messiah would come and restore a one language, a pure speech, and bring unity of the people again that was actually dispersed at this time from the Tower of Babel. Check this out, Uh, Acts chapter 2 now. The day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, says this, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire. Remember, coming in in sound of of, of rushing wind and fire, just like on uh, Mount Sinai, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. Look what it says. In other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So here they were of one language and now imparts to them a Another language. Now there was dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. At the Tower of Babel, every nation was together in one language, and God confused that language and dispersed them. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, all the nations were in one place, and God imparted into them one pure speech. Are y'all seeing this? You guys see this? This is... This is some beautiful stuff, a a beautiful mirror here. Every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. So so Pentecost is not a it's not a scary word. It just it means 50 days. It's the celebration. But but in Acts chapter 2, it's not just the celebration of the law given to Moses. We see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is actually a fulfillment of all those things. It's it's the blessed reversal of the law that brought death to the spirit that gives life. And it's the blessed reversal of Babel that brought confusion in a new language that brings power. Come on, somebody, are you seeing this? 
This is beautiful. This is, and, and, and when they were filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, they spake, spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, and this is another area that brings a lot of confusion in the body of Christ and in Christianity and, and, and this thing about tongues. But again, if we could just peel back the layers and all like the people and the packaging and the preconceived notion and just look at the word of God and let's go to the truth, man. If it's God, then it's good. Can I get an amen, somebody? If it's in there, then I want to know about it without the filters of all the stuff and people. Let's just get to the truth of the word of God. What does his word say about these tongues we see showing up in scripture? A lot of the confusion around tongues today is because I think... A, a lot of people don't understand that there's four types of tongues. Did you know that? So when we see, so when a lot of people read the Bible and they see tongues, they're just thinking it's the same thing, the same thing every time you read it throughout the New Testament, the book of Acts, but it's not. There's actually four types of tongues in the Bible. And I think this is going to clear up a lot of the confusion that you might have. If you do have confusion with tongues, it's probably because of this. Let me give you the four types of tongues according to the scripture. Let's get rid of all this, the clutter, man, and let's just get to the word of God. What are the types of tongues? The first type of tongues we see in this instance, in Acts chapter 2, is, is a type of tongue as a language. Okay, that's what happened in this occurrence in Acts 2, 4, that when the, when the apostles, the disciples were filled with the spirit, they were baptized in the spirit, they spoke in tongues, but it was a language they did not learn or understand. But all the nations that were there that spoke different languages, they were hearing them speak in their language. This was a supernatural occurrence of tongues that, that it was actually a language being spoken that was heard. Now, as you read through the book of Acts, in the other times where people were baptized in the Spirit and they spoke in tongues, it was not a tongue as a language. There was no language that was being spoken. It was a different type of tongue. However, we absolutely see, biblically, we can see there is a type of tongue that is a known language. But it's not the only type. There's another type in the scriptures of tongue. The second type is a prayer language. Did you know there is a tongue that is a prayer language that God gives to you? Romans chapter 8 verse 26 says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, then when we don't know what to pray for, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf with unintelligible words. Words we don't understand, groanings that we don't understand. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 6, listed there in the armor of God, the very last piece he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions. So put on that armor, the helmet and the belt and the breastplate and the shoes and get that sword. But, but and then he ends it and pray, make sure you pray in the Spirit. So there is a tongue that is a prayer language that is used both for intercession and warfare, okay? That's, that's, that's the second type of tongue. The third type of tongue is a tongue as a form of praise. Now, according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 14 tells us there is singing in the spirit and praising in a tongue that other people do not even understand and nor do you. There is a praise, a tongue of praise, a heavenly praise, that, that is scriptural and biblical, that is a type of tongue when you read the scriptures, okay? And a lot of people don't know that there's multiple types of tongues. According to the Bible, there's multiple types of tongues. The fourth type of tongue is the tongue that actually needs an interpretation. It is a proclamation or a message to an assembly, a group of people that necessitates interpretation. And this is what Paul is talking about, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And this is the type of tongue that gets confused a lot, where people go, well, no, we need to interpret that. Oh, no, you shouldn't. You should just never speak in tongues because it always needs interpretation. No, hear me out. Please listen to me. Not every tongue needs interpretation. That is not biblical. Your prayer language does not need interpretation. There is nothing biblical about that that ever says when you're praying in the Spirit that you need to go find an interpretation. No, it actually says that you don't know what you're praying for and the Spirit is praying on your behalf. Okay? And when you're singing in the Spirit in tongues and you're praising God in tongues, it actually, you don't need to get an interpretation for that. In fact, the Bible says you don't know and other people don't know what in the world you're singing and praising God. So there's not a need. It doesn't necessitate interpretation. The, the, the tongues that necessitates interpretation 
according to the Bible, you guys, is, is a tongue that is given as a message to, an, to a group of people, an assembly, so that there isn't confusion in the body of Christ. There needs to be a gift of interpretation to interpret the proclamation that was spoken over people, not interceding over here, but spoken over people. That's, that's the tongue that needs interpretation. So, so Pentecost, you guys, again, it's, it's, it's not spooky. It's not weird. It's not a religion. It's, it's a beautiful thing that Jesus, that, that it's a fulfillment of a promise. It is, it is the fulfillment and the reversal of the law that brought death to the spirit that gives life and the reversal of, of Babel that brought confusion to a heavenly language that brings power. This is, so the question isn't even, the question is not what is Pentecost. That's not the question that these disciples were having because they knew. They know what Pentecost is. It's cultural to them. So that's not the question. The question is not what is Pentecost. The real question is, can I experience Pentecost? Can I? Can, can, can we experience that? I mean, 24 years later, Acts chapter 19 doesn't it make sense now that why the apostles, ever, even 24 years later, they're going to people who are believers and they're going, oh, you believe in Jesus? Great. But did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Because it's one thing to, to understand, to have an awareness of the prophecy of the Messiah, but it's another thing to be empowered for purpose. Like this is like, it's one thing for you to get, yeah, the Messiah came, but did you receive the Holy Spirit that brought us from the law to, to life, that brought us from confusion to power? Did, is this, did you get it? Did you receive that? It makes sense now, doesn't it? That why this was so important for the apostles to not just like make sure that people knew Jesus, but that they knew the power of the Holy Spirit. Can we experience a Pentecost ourself, can we experience a baptism of the Spirit? I'm hopefully going to answer that question with you as we just look to the Scripture, not to your tradition, not to the people, not to the packaging, not to even your perspective and preconceived notion, but the Word of God must be the guiding source of every child of God. Can we experience this? About 20 years later, after Paul goes to Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, he writes this in Ephesians chapter 5, 18. He writes him a letter to that church. And he tells him, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery, sinful living. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Still admonishing people, be filled. Now, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, there's three things that the Holy Spirit needs. Now, I gave you the Bible study theology side. Can I get the practical side to you now, okay? There's three things you need uh, that the Holy Spirit needs in order to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Three things. Number one is this. He needs control. He needs control of your life. Total control. The reality is some of us are still holding on to pieces and parts of our lives. And there was a reason why the Apostle Paul correlated being filled with the Spirit, with drunkenness. Don't get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And, and the reason is because these people have something in common. They're both controlled. Their lives and their behaviors are radically changed by what fills them. See, if a man is filled with anger, anger's gonna control his life. If a person is filled with greed, then greed is gonna dominate and dictate their decisions all their life. But if a person is filled with love, then love influences all they do. When, when the Holy Spirit fills you, he has that controlling influence in your life. Let me just kind of pause and make a critical distinction. Write this down. Being filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean I have more of the Spirit. It actually means the Spirit has more of me. Like, like I'm still holding on to things and thinking I can have all of God when he doesn't have all of me. And that's not going to happen. If I want him to fill me, then i got to give him absolute control. I have to surrender. So what does he need? He needs control. The second thing he needs to fill you is he needs your cooperation. Did you know that? Some of you are like, no, nah, the Holy Spirit don't need me. God doesn't need me. No, listen, you have the Holy Spirit. If you're a child of God dwelling inside of you right now, but yet he still wants to fill you with a whole measure completely. 
He desires to do that, which means this. The central issue is not the Holy Spirit. It's actually your cooperation because he's already willing. And, and Am I going to cooperate with the Holy Spirit and let him lead me, or am I going to keep trying to do things my own way? And that there is a central issue. Write it down like this. We fight the Lord because we want to do things our way. That is the fight. That is the struggle. We want to do it our way. Concerning speaking in tongues, very often you might hear people say or heard people say, just let the Holy Spirit speak. Oh, surrender. Let the Spirit speak. That expression conveys the wrong idea that the Holy Spirit is the one doing the speaking. And according to the Bible, that's not true. Look, the Bible clearly teaches that the man does the speaking and the, the Spirit directs what is spoken, according to the Scripture. Me, meaning this, there is a miracle, it's supernatural, don't get me wrong, but it's, if you're speaking in tongues, if someone's speaking in tongues, there's no miracle in that at all. It is what they are declaring. That's the miracle. Not the act of tongues, but in what they declare, which, which just simply means this, you guys. You, the Holy Spirit needs your cooperation. Because he's not a ventriloquist and you're not a dummy. Okay? He needs, he needs control, but he needs your cooperation. And the third thing he needs is contact. There needs to be contact. Being filled with the Spirit, sometimes it's thought of like, like a tank of gas or something. When I'm, when I'm empty, i got to get filled again and let me get filled again. And that's not, I don't think, a good analogy or representation of what it means to be filled with the spirit empty and filled again kind of deal i think a better analogy has to do with like those electric railways the subways there's there's on the electric railways there's there's a third rail that powers it two tracks two of the rails that they they they're for the wheels and they get it that the tracks that it actually goes on but the third rail is for the electricity when the when the train is touching the third rail rail it has the power to go but the moment it lifts off the third well, the train stops. Will you write it down like this? His power is always available. The third rail is always there. But when sometimes we live out of contact with his power. And when that happens, our lives simply stop working the way that God intended it to work. We don't move in the spirit the way God wants us to move when we're not in contact with the spirit. So, so how do we be filled with the Spirit then? How do we do it? Let me give you four things, okay? Number one, you got to remove every obstacle between you and Him, between you and God, every barrier between you and God. See, some of us have doctrinal hang-ups that honestly aren't even in the Bible. They're just traditional or things that you were taught, that you were told, that you were exposed to, that is actually preventing you from receiving the goodness of God and the promise of the Holy Spirit, the way at least the Bible explains to us. We got to remove some of the barriers of some doctrinal hang-ups that isn't even in the Bible. Are you ready for this? Don't even just take my word for it. Go to the Word of God yourself. Study it. Read it. Know it. God, is this you? Is this good? And is it for me? Learn it yourself. Discover that and remove the barriers. Or maybe it's not doctrinal hanger for some of you. Maybe you need to remove the sin in your life as a barrier. Maybe there's things you're still holding on to that you know that God has told you to surrender and to give up. And there's no way, listen, there's no way you're going to have all of God when he doesn't have all of you. That's a barrier. That is a barrier. Your surrender is a barrier to you receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So, so we got to remove it. On the day of Pentecost, when, when the disciples were baptized in the Spirit and everybody saw it, P Peter actually stands up and he, he gives this amazing sermon. Part of that sermon, Acts chapter 2, Peter says this, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So here's what you do. Let go let go of it. Let God forgive you and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because this promise, listen, is for you, church. This promise is for you and for your children. And look what it says, for all who are far off, 
Well, maybe it's just for those people. Maybe it's just for, you know, Bible times and stuff. According to the scriptures, it's for you, your children, their children, for everyone who would fall off, for everyone who calls on the name of our Lord God. That's it. It's everyone. It's for you. So, so the first thing we got to do is just remove all these barriers that are preventing you from actually believing this. And then once we do that, number two, you can just simply request the gift. That's what Jesus called him, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We can begin to ask God for this. Pursue God. Okay, this is good. It's for me. It's there. Then I, I want it, God. You just ask for it. You go, Pastor, is it that easy? Yes, it's a gift. It's a gift. I remember when, when I gave my life to Christ, it was about a month later. I, got a, I was so hungry for the Word of God and for God's presence. And uh, my wife, who was just the person who invited me to church at the time, Veronica, had been, you know, a, a part of church her whole life as a kid and pursued God and never really experienced what we're reading about today, this baptism of the Spirit experience or even any, any of the four types of tongues. She'd never experienced it and she desired that. And it was a month after I gave my life to Christ and I'm in my room and I'm reading the Word. I'm actually reading about in Acts about this, the baptism of the Spirit and the power of God. And I'm like, I had a study Bible, so I'm like, I'm flipping over to different pages about the Holy Spirit, and I'm getting so excited. And I'm like, I have no, by the way, no religious background, no like, so I don't have a lot of the hangups that maybe people have, because I wasn't, I, I just, I just don't. I was a blank slate, and I'm just reading it going, this is amazing. I just stopped reading, I'm just like, God, fill me with your Spirit. And the Holy Spirit filled me, and I started speaking in tongues right there in my room. And I'm just like praising God and the Spirit, and after a few minutes, I, 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 I stop, I call Veronica, who's just like my girlfriend at the time, and I'm like, Veronica, you won't believe this. I just was real. I told her experience. I got filled with the Spirit. She was so happy for me, celebrating with me. And then she was like, but why you? <laughs> like, that's cool and all. I'm happy for you. But I'm just wondering here, like, why? I've been looking for this. In fact, I, I, the Lord called me to the military, went into the Navy, and I was at Camp Lejeune getting field medical combat training. And it was, I remember at, um, when 9-11 happened, we, I was actually getting combat tra medical combat training at that time in North Carolina. And when you guys, uh, you probably remember when you're at 9-11, but as civilians experiencing 9-11, it probably hits you a certain way. But as someone like in the military experiencing 9-11, um, and, and getting like combat training, it does, it hits you differently. We were thinking like, okay, this is on us. You know, this, someone attacked, someone attacked our, our, our country, our people. Where are we going? What do we need to do to protect our country? So everyone on the base was just hit different, man. We were, we were ready. We were being prepared for war. And I remember that evening of 9-11, I'm in my room and I'm reading the scriptures and I'm actually reading in Matthew about the end times. And the Bible says that there's gonna be wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and earthquakes and all these things. But then Jesus says that the, the one who endures to the end will be saved. And as I'm reading this and kind of studying end time stuff, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. This is the first time that it, like the breath, the voice of God in my spirit that I heard him. It wasn't like an audible voice, but, but in my spirit, I heard God whisper to me, get up. Go to the rec room. I want to use you. And it was as I was reading, and I'm reading to myself, and I get that. I'm like, where did that come from? It's weird. So I keep going, not knowing like what that was, but it came again just like before. Get up. Go to the rec room. I want to use you. And I recognize, okay, that was God. So I get up. I go just down the hall. The rec room was this. I was in the barracks at that time, these military barracks. And the rec room had like pool tables and games and this big screen TV couches and stuff and I walk in there and there's some marines and some other docs in there like watching the the 9-11 replay that was on repeat at this time and everyone's just glued to that tv and I just I just stand in the back of the room praying like okay God what am I supposed to do here and after a few moments one person right here that was watching the tv they went to a break and he said I wonder if this has anything to do with the end times and every head in unison turned around to me and I'm all Well, actually, I was just reading in my Bible, and I just was telling him what I just read. That didn't last time. Here's what God says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And they're like, you were just, what do you mean you were just reading? this? yeah, my, you, you want to go check it out? We can study this ourselves. Three of them followed me back to the room. We studied it together, and they gave their life to Christ that night. It was beautiful. It was an amazing moment. 
I, I was so excited after they left. I call my wife, my fiance now at, at this time, and I give her a call. And I'm like, honey, you won't believe this. God just spoke to me, and I'm telling her like how amazing it was, and this is what happened, and people got saved. And she's like, wow, I'm so proud of you, and that's great. And wow, but then she's like, but why are you? <laughs> like, I'm good, good for you and stuff, and I'm happy, but I'm like, man. And th the Lord spoke to me like this scripture that I put in your notes that I gave, that I gave her. I, I told her, look, you already have the Holy Spirit. He's in you. Luke chapter 11, 13 says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So, so honey, you have, listen, you have, if you're a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You need to just ask Him. And then, I told, I told her, and I'm going to tell you today this third thing. you got to receive Him by faith. By faith, you have to receive this gift. It's everything, listen to me, everything God has for you, it's going to take faith for you to activate it. Everything God has for you. He's trying to get you from this place of natural to his realm of operation, which is supernatural. It's going to take faith. It's, meaning this, it's going to seem like a risk. It's going to seem like a step of uncertainty. You're going to, in order to receive this gift that we're talking about today of the Holy Spirit to be baptized and full of the Spirit. I got to receive him by faith. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. It's like you already got the gift. And this is what I'm telling Veronica. You already got the present. It's all bowed up and wrapped and everything. All you got to do is open it up and receive it by faith right now. She hung up the phone like that and I knew, oh, what's happening right now? And it was, she, right there, right after hanging up the phone, the Holy Spirit filled her, right where she was in her room. And she started speaking in, in, in tongues. And, and, and since that day, her life has changed. My life's been changed. I, it doesn't save you, it didn't save her, but it just gave us a, a new power. A new, a new power, a new anointing to, to live a successful, effective Christian walk in a very dark world that God wants us to be ambassadors and missionaries and his instruments in. Pentecost is not spooky. It's not a religion. It's not a people. It's a beautiful reversal. It's a beautiful reversal of the law to the spirit of Babel to a language of power. So maybe we need to remove some of the barriers that are preventing us from actually receiving what God wants us to receive. Maybe we need to start asking for it, requesting him, God, I want it. I want everything, whatever you have, God, I say yes. And then receive him by faith. Take the step and open up your mouth because he's not gonna treat you like a puppet. And then lastly, and I wanna like, not just end today's message, but end this entire series with this thought. I want you to relate to God, the Holy Spirit, every day of your life. Because he's, listen, the Holy Spirit isn't weird. He's your best friend. He wants to be your counselor, your advocate, your comforter, your helper. He wants to be with you. Relate to him every day. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. It says, may the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ and the extravagant love of God, but the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And that's my prayer for you, is that you would develop an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.